Well, I feel I feel like running away after such a <laughs> such a generous welcome. Um, I'm so conscious that I am really just a clapped out bishop now living in Scotland, um, and uh, I've been. I've been to Scotland since I retired nearly nine years ago now, so I'm something of an outsider to the workings of the Church of England, um, and uh, I'm conscious that that may well limit my capacity to speak into the situations all of you are in. But it it was a huge privilege to be asked to come and uh, speak to you today, um, and it didn't feel like something I could really refuse. So I can only hope that by reflecting with you on scripture, uh, something at least of what we look at will be fruitful for you, even though I run the risk of saying things that you've already all thought for yourselves many times over. It may seem a bit bizarre just before Lent to look at a chapter of the Bible which is all about Easter, but I want to argue that uh, the last chapter of the Gospel of John opens up for us nearly all, not all, but nearly all of the great themes of Christian life and discipleship. And in that sense, it's a good thing to have in our hearts as we move into Lent. Um, And I want to argue, and Bishop Pete's really already said this, that it contains in particular two great themes of being loved and bearing witness. There are some who, uh, and I'm not a New Testament scholar, um, although I have consulted in preparing for this with with a great friend who is, but there are some scholars who still believe uh, that the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John is an appendix added completely separately from the rest of the Gospel. I'm not one of those, um, and my own conviction for what it's worth is that it is an epilogue in the say, and it matches the opening prologue in chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. You may immediately find that a puzzling thing to say, since they feel very differently. But one of the geniuses of John is the capacity of the writer both to give us marvellous poetic prose of the kind we get in chapter 1, although also in the farewell discourses and in other places, and brilliant storytelling. So there's nothing surprising about the fact that the writer might begin with a piece of poetic prose and end with a story. Um, More than that, though, I want to suggest that the um, two of them, the prologue, I'm not going to say much about this, but that the prologue and the epilogue, um, which I think it's quite likely were actually both written by the writer, but maybe a few years after the rest of the gospel took shape rather than added by somebody completely separately. Um, And I think there are are arguments why this is likely to be so. But all I think I want to say about that at the very beginning here is that both the uh, prologue and the epilogue open up for us in different ways the most of the great themes of the gospel itself. The prologue and the epilogue are both about a God who shows up in person. A God who we're told in the prologue the word was with God, the word was God, that in some mysterious way the essence of the God we believe in is communication. And the highest and holiest form of communicating is not speaking but showing up. And that's what we believe, what John tells us God did in the person of Jesus Christ. It is a God who shows up, who appears again in the last chapter of the uh, Gospel. But there are a number of other great themes, I'm just going to list them now, that occur in both the prologue and the epilogue. I bet you know all this already, but just uh, let me just remind you of them. Knowledge, the world did not know him in chapter 1. You know that I love you in chapter 21. Uh, Light, the contrast between light and darkness, I'll come back to that one. The world, an extraordinarily interesting an important concept in John's gospel which appears in the beginning and the end and comes right at the very end of the gospel and I'll finish with that one. Uh, Children, power to become children of God, children you have no fish, glory, truth Uh, and then two final themes. One is love, 
although in the first opening prologue there's no explicit reference to love, and yet the whole of that prologue is suffused with love. Very striking that one word that the prologue and epilogue both contain, a beautiful intimate word, is the word breast or bosom. Unlikely thing suddenly to um, introduce to you, but there it is. Curious that some modern translations of the Bible clearly feel embarrassed about the use of the word bosom, um, but it's there in 1 verse 18, something about the only son um, who was in the, fa- uh, in the father's breast, or at the father's breast, the Greek word is kolpos. Um, I can't remember the rest of the sentence now, but anyway, you can see it there for yourself. And it's translated with good Anglican politeness in the NRSV as the only son who was at the father's side or in the father's heart, as if bosoms were something we should shy away. Well, <laughs> better refresh. <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean that to come out like that. I'm so sorry. Uh, anyway, you... Oh dear, how embarrassing. But you... All, all I want to say is that... Um, Oh, this is going to be difficult. Um, the, the, and, and the same thing appears in chapter 21, uh, where it talks about the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, the one who leant on the breast of Jesus at the supper. Um, the say, uh, actually, there are two different words in the Greek, but they mean exactly the same thing. And they're both about the intimate love of God for us. Uh, and that great theme is one of the two I want to look at today. And the other great theme, which again combines chapter 1 and chapter 21, is bearing witness. In chapter 1, it's John the Baptist who bears witness. And in chapter 21, it's the writer of the gospel, whom we only know by tradition. It's the Apostle John, but there's no reason necessarily to restrict it to the Apostle John. All we know about the writer of John's gospel is that this person was loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved and that disciple ends by bearing witness there's one other thing though that the two of them the introductory chapter and the conclusion uh, conclusion have in common and that's a rather unexpected one it's the reference to we I don't mean as in Scotland a we toty place or a, I mean we as in the first person plural and that comes at least for me when I read it even though we're so familiar with the word it still comes or can come as something of a surprise and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory suddenly the focus moves from what might have happened at the dawn of time and then at the incarnation of Jesus, to now, we have seen the community from which the gospel arose suddenly come on stage. Exactly the same thing happens at the very end of the gospel. This is the disciple, I think it's verse 24, we'll come to it in a minute, who is bearing witness to these things, and we know that his testimony is true. I want to suggest that this introduction of we, which appears nowhere else in the gospel, only at the beginning and the end, is not just to anchor the whole gospel in the life of the Johannine community, it's to include you and me. This is going to be our story, as well as the story of Jesus and his first disciples. We have seen his glory. We are going to be invited to be witnesses to what it is the gospel will tell us. But there's one final, I keep saying that and when it isn't quite like, like any uh, vicar, um, there's one uh, final um, thing about chapter 21 which is not the same as chapter 1 and that is that it introduces us to a sense of failure of anticlimax, of a kind of is this it feeling, um, which I'll, I'll want to say a little bit about. But let's now move, now I forgot what I've got to do, into the um, text itself. If I press that one, does that work? Of course, I'm in the way here. Can, can you, is that all right? Can you see it all right? You may have your own versions there on your phones or... Um, and really what I want to do now is just to go through the chapter. We won't look at every verse and we'll be here all day. But um, anyway, after these things, Jesus showed himself. Have you got that? Yes. 
again to the disciple. The, 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 I, I meant to check this last night, dash, I forgot, but never mind. The Greek word to show yourself, to make manifest, is another great John word. It comes, I think, nine times in the gospel, three of which are in chapter 21, right here. To, and this is all part of the, John's theme about the longing of God to communicate, to show up in person. Jesus revealed himself, made himself vulnerable, came among us, dwelt among us, tented among us, um, extends the theme. And then we're given, um, he showed himself in this way, gathered there together with Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee. Why are we being told those particular names? Commentators vary in their answer to that question. I want to suggest, I may be wrong, but I offer it just as a humble suggestion. The reason those five are mentioned by name is not accidental, it's because they were all failures. In one way or another, each one of these let Jesus down or completely misunderstood what Jesus was inviting them to do and to be. Peter, as we'll see in a minute most conspicuously, by denying Jesus. Thomas, by doubting Jesus. Nathaniel, who couldn't believe anything good could possibly come out of um, uh, Nazareth. Um, the sons of Zebedee, who are not otherwise mentioned by that title in the um, chapter, in, in the whole gospel, but they were the ones, if you remember, who wanted to sit on either side of Jesus uh, in glory. And I think what's striking here is that we're being told it's something which I'm going to refer to briefly in my little homily uh, at the Eucharist. Something that is very characteristic of all the Gospels is the fact that we're being told in unsparing detail that the disciples so often got it wrong. And that, I think, is something rather striking. Indeed, I find it rather reassuring, I don't know about you, because if there's room for failures in the church, then maybe there's room for me. Um, and in one way or another, we're not here because we're successes, but because we know we're failures. And the gospel is rooted in the witness of failures who yet knew or felt loved and welcomed into the community of the church. Peter takes the initiative then, verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. You can read this in different ways, but I think it, it, it over, overwhelmingly it contains a feeling of anticlimax, don't you think? A kind of, I don't know quite what else to do now. Peter, who was always more comfortable doing things than being still, decides to go fishing. In his great series of sermons on the Gospel of John, 125 of them, Augustine of Hippo, back in the fourth century, uh, reflects on this passage and says, uh, I'm using my words because he, write, he writes a great length, but the gist of what he says is, why did Peter want to go back to fishing uh, for fish when he'd been called away from that to fish for people? Why did he want to go back again? He then argues with himself, Augustine, I mean, and says, well, St. Paul carried on being a tent maker. Maybe Peter had no choice economically. After all, there was a Mrs. Peter, I mean, a Mrs. <laughs> a wife, and um, maybe he'd had no option but to go back to work, uh, which would be true of so many people. But, says Augustine, and I don't think I have Anyway, it doesn't matter. But the gist of what he says is, it didn't work when he goes back to fishing here. They catch nothing, as we'll see in a moment. What Augustine underlines in his commentary here, or sermon here, is this. That you can go and carry on with some, well, go back to some work that you did before. But in one of the great lessons life teaches us, and especially the Bible teaches us, is that you can't ever go back home. You can't go back if you mean to turn the clock back to something you did once. You might go home uh, or you might go fishing again, but you can't go back to doing something you used to do. You can only go, go because both the work or the home, I'll return to this theme a little later, and you will have moved on in some way. So an attempt to turn the clock back and just go back to being a fisher of fish is going to be doomed to failure. Um, but that night they caught nothing. And this introduces us to another reason why um, uh, um, the work wasn't fulfilling um, or wasn't fruitful. 
there's clearly a link here, I suggest, between uh, John chapter 21 and Matthew verse, uh, Matthew, sorry, chapter 14. Do you remember the story of the disciples who were also in a boat? I mean, they're different stories, though Peter has a key role in both of them. The boat in both chapter 21 of John and in Matthew clearly represents the church. And what's striking and challenging in a way uh, in both of these stories is that Jesus, at least for a while, is not in the boat. He's not in the church with the disciples. He's out there in the world. And the disciples have to recognize his presence out there. When they try to work without Jesus, things don't work. It's fruitless. First, they have to remember that Jesus is not their private possession to be easily domesticated, but is someone who is always free of the, the, you know, the institution, so to speak, free to come and go, and is as often to be seen out there in the world, a world which is frequently hostile, as he is in um, the church. There are times in life, and this is part of the, you might say, the dialectic, the tension through John's gospel. There's a tension between presence and absence. There are times when Jesus is present. There are times when he's absent. In the wonderful story you all know in chapter 9 of the healing of the man born blind, Jesus is present for only, I can't remember now, six or seven verses out of, I think, 41. It's a long story. Most of the time, Jesus steps back. Not to test the man, but to remind all readers that there are times when Jesus feels close to us. And if we're honest, unless we're astonishingly privileged, there will be times when Jesus feels distant. Sometimes just when we most want him to feel close to us. And a real absence can be just as real as a real presence. I said last night that um, I remember when my mother died many years ago, and many, all of you will have had some experience of loss, um, and how people said to me then, uh, words which I'm sure I said to many, many people as a, as a pastor uh, before that. When my mother died, people said to me things like, oh, well, she had a good innings and um, it was, a, you know, she had a lot to look back on and uh, it was a blessed release. And some of that was true, but it helped me not remotely. Because what hit me at the time was not whether she had a good innings or not. It was simply that she wasn't there. The real absence of someone is just as real uh, as a real presence is. Um, And the Gospel of John constantly speaks into that situation. And if we seek to work, whatever kind of work, or live, uh, or be a Christian, uh, without Jesus being consciously with us, without inviting him in, then things will go wrong. And this may well reflect some of the experience of the early Christian church. I was thinking just this morning as we listened in morning prayer to a bit of the letter to the Galatians, which of course would be a good deal earlier than this gospel, you get the same thing. The early church was not a wonderful success story. Um, All my life, as uh, listening to Bishop Pete introduce me, which is hideously embarrassing, but all my life, wherever I went as a pastor, as as an ordained minister, I always followed somebody good. And was absolutely maddening. <laughs> I don't know whether you've had the same experience, but everywhere I went, especially in Liverpool, funnily enough, when I started, everybody used to say to me, oh, Alan was so good when my husband died, or oh, Alan was so good with the young people, and I'd be like, oh, what about the old people? Oh, he was wonderful with the old people. Oh, what about the middle? Oh, he was fantastic with the middle-aged people. I thought, oh, the swine. I mean, I felt so sorry. But, <laughs> but it left me with a crippling feeling of kind of inadequacy. Anyway, that's another story. But um, I don't know how I got onto that now, except to say that I think the truth is, and I discovered this eventually, that actually, when I finally met this guy, he was a really lovely person, which made it even worse. I was hoping (laughs) hoping he'd have been really horrible. He was a lovely, lovely, he probably still is. Um, In fact, I'm sure he still is. But I mention this because however lovely your predecessor was, that was then. There's no going back home in life, in Christianity anyway, Maybe another what's low, but not for us. And the idea of an imagined ideal early Christian church is a load of nonsense, as the scripture itself underlines for us. The early church had to wrestle with division and disagreement and problems and tensions, um, just as maybe sometimes you find you are and I find I am. And yet it was out of that strange mixture of, of committed life-changed Christians and 
hassle and argument and stushes, as they, we call it in Scotland, and, you know, fallings out. It was out of that community that the gospel and the spirit of Pentecost came alive. And maybe in that sense, this is good news for us as well. Let me move on. Gosh, I must keep an eye on the time. Just, I've only got to verse 4. Just after daybreak, Jesus now appears on the scene. And what he says is... Uh, oh, no, I've got to press this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Is that it? Jesus says to them, Children, you have no fish. As the darkness of the night where they failed turns to the light, another theme from John chapter 1, Jesus appears in person. And he speaks to them with a gentle intimacy, calling them children, paideia in Greek. And he has that lovely, you haven't caught anything, have you? Um, If you did Latin years ago, like I did, you'll remember that Latin has a particular construction, uh, the three-lettered preposition num, N-U-M, or num quid, which is the beginning of a question expecting the answer so no, you haven't had a big breakfast. Oh, that's not a very good example. I can't think of an example now. Oh, never mind. Anyway, you see what I mean. And the same thing appears in the Greek here. Um, children, literally, children, not any fish have you. It's a kind of, um, it's reproachful, uh, and yet it's also gently and lovingly confronting them with the reality. You've blown it, haven't you, guys? Um, But the implication of the way it's written is that they're still loved. They're still valued. They failed, but they're still loved. Uh, And Jesus then introduces to them another way forward. It's the theme of unconditional love, to which I'll return in a few moments' time. Cast the net to the right side. Try another way. And constantly in the Gospel of John, Jesus is inviting people to see a different way, to imagine things differently, to visualize a different kind of uh, future. Do you remember Brueggemann, the great Old Testament writer, who talks about, um, in one of his early books, I think it's that book, Hopeful Imagination, anyway, one of Brueggemann's things. Bishop Pete will know much more about Anyway, never mind. Um, and Brueggemann makes the point that people are not changed by ethical urging, but by a transformed imagination. If you just say to one of your kids, stop doing that, your kids may be stunningly well behaved, but tends not to work very well. If you can invite them into a different vision, a different way of looking at things, you may have a chance of changing lives. And Jesus is doing that all through the gospel. Now we come into the heart of chapter 21. Um, Am I all right? You're not getting bored, silly, or... um, Uh, And the contrast that comes now is between two different people, Peter and the uh, disciple whom Jesus loved. This is verse 7. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Let me just say, first of all, I think um, this takes us to the heart of the matter. Um, The disciple whom Jesus loved, who's not named in the gospel, um, though by tradition is linked with the the apostle John, uh, all we know about this person is that they were loved by Jesus. This person was probably a man, but I want to say to you that I think it's just as uh, important to stress that this person stands for any Christian, women and men, female and male, all, all people, are uh, uh, because what's distinctive about this person is simply that they were loved. And so this is a contrast, what we're offered here, simply between two different ways of being church, two different ways of being a Christian. And that's how that cha- this chapter's been interpreted since at least Augustine's day and probably earlier. Augustine himself compares two different ways of thinking about church and about being a Christian disciple. The one represented by Peter, who Augustine speaks about as the church of faith, whereas he says the beloved disciple represents the church of vision. Uh, Peter represents the pilgrim church, the active church. The beloved disciple represents the church at rest, the Sabbath church, the contemplative church. There are many other people who've suggested different analogies here, some of which I find less convincing. I remember that Gregory the Great um, talks about, in one of his sermons on John, talks about... Actually, well, I've forgotten. What does he talk about? Oh, he do. <laughs> It's terribly pompous, isn't it? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have started that sentence. It was probably patient strong, but it sounds better to say Gregory. <laughs> no, I, I think it actually was Gregory the Great, but he, I know, I'm sure it's Gregory the Great who argues that uh, Peter represents the Jewish church and the beloved disciple the Gentile church, but I don't find that terribly persuasive. A bit more persuasive is uh, John Henry Newman, Cardinal Newman, 
who suggest that uh, Peter represents the Episcopal Church or the institutional church and the beloved disciple represents the prophetic church. But I think that the most compelling of these different analyses or ways of opening up this chapter is that of the Swiss Roman Catholic theologian Hans von Balthasar. He suggests in two of his books, and incidentally all the references to the people I refer to, if you're interested in following them up, I've got in my notes and I can happily email them to, to Bill here or something. If if they're of any interest, if you want to follow them up further. Balthazar um, suggests that um, Peter represents what he calls the church of office, the institutional church, and the beloved disciple represents what he calls the church of love, the church of office, visible, active, uh, involved in the world, um, but has the limitations of all institutions. It's prone to get more interested in self perpetuation and so on than it is in what it was originally there for. The church of love, the hidden, often silent presence of those who see uh, Christ either in the church or in this case out in the world and steer the church of office if it's receptive um, to where Jesus is present. The church of office symbolized by doing things, the church of love symbolized by being. And it is the disciple whom Jesus loved who recognizes Jesus. Verse 6, it is the Lord. Not just it is Jesus, but it is the Lord. Um, It sometimes is the hidden, less starry-eyed, not people with titles like right reverend uh, or reverend or anything else, uh, who will see the truth of Jesus, the living presence of Jesus, in ways that some of us who are very busy find uh, we need to be uh, reminded of. Very striking, isn't it, that in the... um, other gospels it's so often outsiders who see the truth about Jesus when insiders don't Uh, I've said already how the disciples in the gospel so often are described as getting it all wrong but it's striking how many outsiders um Pilate's wife, remember, who says, uh, and you'll no doubt be preaching on this in a few weeks' time, have nothing to do with that righteous man, dikaios, meaning more than innocent, which the NRSV has, that righteous man. She sees, uh, uh, the wife of a Gentile governor sees the truth about Jesus. And in Mark's gospel, where Rowan Williams, I think, uh, very helpfully reminds us, do you remember the gospel of Mark that begins with the words, um, uh, the beginning of the gospel or good news of Jesus Christ, uh, something about the the, the book of Isaiah, the word uh, gospel, euangelion, or in Latin evangelium, literally meaning just good, a good message really, EU good and angelium, a a messenger or messenger, good news. What I didn't know till I read Rowan Williams' lovely book about Mark um, is that it was the word used in the imperial culture of Rome to celebrate the emperor's birthday or a general's triumphal procession. So it was a word that uh, was rooted in the power structure of imperial Rome. And this word, so it was a loaded word. And what Rowan Williams is suggesting is that for this word to be used in the four gospels, as it is repeatedly, to talk about a different kind of ruler is to remind us that this isn't just a king who is uh, greater than Caesar, it's going to be about regime change, as Rowan Williams puts it. And that's why I think in Mark's gospel, who is it who sees the full truth about Jesus but a Roman centurion, a Gentile non-believer, a battle-hardened NCO, uh, as Jesus dies on the cross, it's a Roman centurion who says, truly this man was God's son. Here, says the centurion, is a power that one day will subvert imperial Rome. And in Jesus's, in, in John's gospel, it's the disciple whom Jesus loves who sees the truth. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the lake. I was saying last night that I don't, I've read quite a lot of Balthazar's work and it's pretty heavy going. It's not exactly Mills and... Oh, stupid thing to say. I mean, but it is, it is pretty heavy. But there is here one, the only joke I've ever come across in Balthazar. When he talks about Peter putting his clothes on and jumping into the water. Balth, sorry about Bishop Pete, but Balthazar says that's typical of a bishop. He couldn't bear the thought of appearing in front of Jesus without wearing his cope and mitre. So he puts them all and jumps into the water despite the fact that he'll then arrive all soggy and wet and looking a right wally. But anyway, that's uh, Balthazar's moment of um, 
and, he, I, I, and Balthazar goes on to say sometimes the church of office has to recognize that it will look very foolish in the eyes of the world, especially when it's drawing attention more to its own dignity. Then there's the thing about, I'm going to hurry on here, hauling the net ashore. Um, the net, uh, though filled with so many, was not torn. The Greek word schizine, meaning ripped apart like schizophrenic or the, the veil of the temple split down the middle. It was not torn. It remained one. Here, clearly, there's an image um, of new Christians being drawn in by fruitful discipleship carried out under Jesus' direction. Um, why 153? Well, as you can imagine, scholars for centuries have debated that, and I don't think it's terrible interesting or important really um, I hope not anyway um, but uh, because I think what really matters is not why it was 153 um, though St. Jerome's argument that it was really to do with the that was the number of different sorts of fish people in those days believed there to be out there in the world but surely really this is a typical example of St. John's love of extravagant generosity on the part of Jesus takes us back into the prologue and of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace or the staggering generosity at the wedding at Cana when gigantic quantities of the best wine are produced um, just when it felt like the whole thing was going pear-shaped or the course the feeding of the 5,000 so this is a word about a God who is extravagantly generous in what uh, this God wants to give to us then um, are we still on the same page oh I'm so sorry no we've moved on um, uh, we got past that here come and have breakfast Jesus invites them to come and have breakfast and they do the first as it were in a way Christian Eucharist together and the food that makes up the Eucharist and this is a point William Temple makes in his wonderful, still classic book, Readings in St. John's Gospel. William Temple makes the point that the Eucharist consists partly of what the disciples bring to the table that they've caught, as it were, they've achieved by their own efforts, but under Jesus' direction, and partly of pure gift of food that's already there, that they had no part in bringing. And isn't that true of all worship? It will be partly what you bring to it and others that we've achieved through Christ's gracious leading, but it will also be partly be outright gift that we couldn't possibly have had anything to do with. And at this worship, we are welcomed, even though we've been failures. Then we move on to, um, this is now the third time when the disciples... When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, now the church of office comes under scrutiny and in a few minutes uh, we'll come from that to the church to finish with the church of love as the two disciples take centre stage one after the other. But here it's the church of office in, represented by Peter. Peter is, of course, as you know, the threefold denial of Jesus is going to be... Um, redeemed really by this threefold interrogation here but I want to suggest also that the solemn closing words of the passion according to St John which we'll all listen to on Good Friday are words which are actually a quote from the prophet Zechariah and another scripture says they will look on the one whom they have pierced do you remember those words? Charles Wesley incorporates them in his Advent hymn, Lo, he comes with clouds descending. But they will look on the one whom they have pierced. The ones who hurt Jesus, who killed Jesus, will look on Jesus. And one of them is Peter. And here is Peter looking on the one whom he too has pierced, as we must all do. That's part of what it means to be a failure who's yet uh, redeemed through Christ's love. Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Meaning more than the other disciples do. But why is Jesus being called, why is he calling Peter Simon, son of John, and not Peter? Well, if you remember in John 1, Jesus says after the prologue now, Jesus, when Simon Andrew brings his brother, Jesus says to him, uh, you are Simon, you are to be called Peter. Um, and what Jesus is surely doing here is taking Peter back, as it were, to his original story, to the person he was, and in one way still is, as we all are, before he became a Christian. He, he, he was now Peter, but he was always also Simon, son of John. And Jesus is in effect asking him, 
do you want to pick up this vocation? I love you. I'm ready to offer you, a, a, you know, a, a new stage in your journey of discipleship. But do you want this? He goes back to the, the, the Peter who was a fisherman, who was the son of somebody, who had a life before he became a Christian. All of us are represented there by Peter. I love the way the Bible so often opens up the inner landscape of someone um, and reminds us that inside we're all frightened children in one way or another. I've just suddenly remembered the way my feeble brain works. When I was working as dean of the cathedral in Birmingham, we had a big magistrates and judges service once when they all came in their clobber and you know uh, uh, with wigs and robes and things. And I'd asked as preacher Vincent Nichols, who was then the, uh, Arch- the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Birmingham. And when I asked his, his secretary what text he wanted for his sermon for all these judges, he said, I want the story of Jairus, do you remember, whose daughter was ill. And I remember thinking, what a funny thing to pick for all these judges. What's that got to do with the law? And he preached a wonderful sermon about Jairus, who was the synagogue ruler, do you remember? Jairus said, Archbishop Nichols, is um, all of you and me, he said. Jairus is the public figure with the private hurt. He has to manage a synagogue while his daughter is desperately ill. He represents, he said to all these, it was a very impressive, powerful sermon. Um, All of you, you too and me public figures in one way or another, not very much in my case because I'm clapped out in retirement, but public figures who have private hurts. And sometimes it's very hard to minister publicly to people who need support when your own needs don't feel attended to. That's part of the Christian journey too. And I bet every one of you knows how that feels. Peter certainly does. And as we're told in a moment or two, Peter felt hurt as he was taken through this uh, painful process. But then he has to understand that he is still unconditionally loved if he's willing to believe it, even though he's failed. In this sense, I think there is an intended contrast, though it's in Matthew's gospel, between Peter here and Judas. This extraordinary thing, which again, you'll no doubt be preaching on on Good Friday or just around that time. In, in, in all four Gospels, Judas is the demon, and in Christian um, iconography and history, he's always represented as the arch-evil person. And yet we're told in Matthew's Gospel, if you remember, that Judas repented of what he had done, but he still killed himself. Peter's repentance, having denied Christ, was forgiven and healed. Judas's repentance was not. Why not? We're not told. Let me suggest the answer. Because Judas couldn't believe he could be loved and forgiven after what he had done. And there must be millions of people in the world who couldn't believe in a God who'd still love them and accept them if people knew what kind of a life they'd led. That God could love them, as you know, and accept them. But people will not always be able to believe that, which is part of why our pastoral work is so essential. Peter turns out to be able to accept that he was loved, even though he got it wrong. Love is the essential quality of the Gospel of John. A wonderful series of lectures that have not yet been published. I don't know why not. Um, I'm waiting for them by somebody called David Ford, who was Regis Professor at the University of Cambridge. He gave the Bampton Lectures at Oxford University in 2015, all about John's Gospel. They're absolutely marvellous. I've got them all at home, but you perhaps ought to wait for the book to come out or he'll skin me alive. Um, but he, he says in his uh, eight lectures about how love is the core, the core desire that the Gospel of John meets is the desire to be loved. This is supremely emphasized by the special place of the disciple whom Jesus is loved. Jesus, if you remember, at the very beginning of his ministry, at his baptism, when the moment of his maximum exposure, as it were, to the public, up till then he's been a private figure, as he's coming out of the water of baptism into this daunting future, he hears the voice of the Father, you are my son, the beloved. He hears his parents saying to him, you're my child, I love you. Now, you don't need me to ask the question, how many millions of people are there in the world who never hear a parent saying that, who never hear anybody saying that to them, who never develop the fullness of what they have in them to develop because nobody's ever told them they've got any. That's why love, being loved, is 
absolutely fundamental to Christian life. I live in Scotland now um, and uh, I work quite closely in different ways with the established church in Scotland which is quite different from the Church of England the Church of Scotland and its roots are in Calvinism and Calvin often gets a bad press but I think at his heart Calvin's great doctrine of assurance the assurance not just that you're saved but that you're loved that you're safe with God is absolutely fundamental to Christian life I know you can caricature the the, the idea of assurance um, What's that thing about, oh, I can't remember it now. The bells of hell go ting-a-ling-a-ling for you, but not for me. That rather sort of nauseating smugness. But that's not, uh, that's alien to Calvinism. Calvin's great central uh, conviction is that we can all be assured of the love of God. Um, And once we're assured that we're loved, there is no limit to what we can do in God's name. Finally, we come, or not quite finally, but nearly finally, um, the end of the church of office when Jesus, and we probably moved on, yes, three times he tells Peter um, to feed his sheep. I won't go into detail, I'm conscious I'm going on too long as always, um, about the threefold repetition somebody asked me last night, and there is a slight variation in the words, and two different Greek words for love are referred to. I'll come back to that in questioning if you're interested, but actually I think all three are basically saying the same thing. And Jesus is giving the church church of office uh, in these verses and the verses that we're I'm just about to put on the stage uh, on the screen the church of office is given two vocations by Jesus in John 21 the first is pastoral care feed my sheep don't forget it's my sheep Jesus says not your sheep to Peter they're Jesus's sheep Um, and as Charles Spurgeon another great uh, writer in his sermon on this passage points out Spurgeon says don't forget my brothers and sisters that uh, Jesus didn't say drive my sheep he said feed my sheep our calling is a nurturing calling but it's also a caring calling Um, and that's an essential part of the ministry of pastoral care both for those within the Christian church and those outside The second dimension of the call of the church of office is to go out into places of exile, to go where you would rather not go. The word exile doesn't appear in John, but it's a central uh, biblical theme. Again and again, as you know, people find themselves in places of exile. And exile is any experience in life where you're not at home and not in control. So you're not at home here, but you are in control in the sense that if I go on much longer, you'll get up and walk out, and you're free, of course, to do that, because you are in control. But if you were, let's say, in here, and suddenly somebody came in and said, someone's infected with the coronavirus, no one can leave, our experience of having a time this morning would suddenly become an experience of exile. Do you see what I mean? Like being in hospital or in prison or these are places of exile. Uh, and one of the, to repeat what I've said already, one of the great lessons of scripture is that for many, not everyone, but for many, there is a way forward out of exile, but it will be a way forward. You may go home from hospital or out of any place of exile, but you won't go back home because you and home will have moved on. You can only go forward. Um, And the ministry of the church of office is to be there, not just within the church waiting for people to come in, but in places of exile and to share that experience with all the cost that goes with it. Verse 19, he said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Why? Two great themes here uh, come together. Love, I've already said a little bit about, and glory. Let me just quickly say a word about them. Can you bear about ten more minutes? Is that, are you sure that's all right? I'm sorry, I always over... Um, no, I forgot what I was talking about. Love and glory. Well, all I want to say about them now is this. Love in John's gospel and especially here do you love me more than these then you will go out and one day you will die you'll go where you're not in control you'll go into exile it's a worrying uh, in some ways uh, it's a daunting thing being a Christian disciple why is love and death so often bracketed together in the gospel of John Um, greater love has no one than this to lay down your life for your friends why because I suggest to you and the song of songs gives us the clue here love real christian love is itself a kind of dying 
is itself a dying to one's own control over life in order to make room, and that's the theme I'm coming to in a second, uh, make room for the other. So love, a dying to self, um, opens us up to the receiving of new life uh, precisely because we've died to the old one. And glory uh, is always in John a glimpse of what is yet to be. Now, John, in John 13, Judas goes out into the dark to betray Jesus, do you remember? And we're told, now, and it was dark. No, and it was night. And then Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now, not later, now. Why? Well, because in some extraordinary way, through the redeeming love of Jesus on the cross, the, the, the betrayal, the suffering, is the beginning of a glimpse of what is yet to be. I remember for years, I, uh, uh, anyway, um, when I was vicar of a church in South London, uh, we used to share the building with uh, an Afro-Caribbean Pentecostal fellowship. And they would come in and we'd have an hour of Anglican worship and they'd come in for three hours of kind of shifting about. And um, Sorry, so sorry. Um, well, they did really. And foot washing and praising, you know, tremendously invigorating. And I can remember sometimes I'd meet the, the joint pastor team, uh, P, uh, um, David and Una, when they were coming out of the church. And Una would sometimes say to me after a three-hour marathon, and I'd say, have you had a good time you know and she said to me I've seen the glory like this and as you can tell by my accent I'm a kind of rather kind of middle class Anglican type and I remember never being able to think what to say back to her when she said that so when she said I've seen the glory Gordon I would say oh jolly good frightfully well done you know? <laughs> do carry on <laughs> hope there'll be a spot more I hope it wasn't as bad as that but God forgive me I'm afraid <laughs> not one of my less uh, sort of uh, uh, encouraging remembrance but I remember one day meeting Una as I was coming out of our church after our Eucharist and she was coming in in the morning and I thought I'll get one on her this time. So I said to Una, you'll be looking forward to seeing the glory today, Una. And she said, I've already seen the glory today, Gordon. And I said, but you, you haven't started yet. And she said, no, she said, but I've seen the glory that's yet to be. In other words, I can't remember what the word she used after that, I just remember that bit. What she went on to say to me is, she woke up every morning expecting to see a glimpse of glory that day. And because she expected to see it, she did see it. Because I tended to woke up and thought, oh my God, it's Monday, or you know what I mean, I often didn't see it. That's that Pentecostal insight into the glory of God, a glimpse, eyes go into the glory land, is a reminder of a kind of defiant, subversive hope that's central to Christian spirituality, though it isn't always as present as it might be in the institutional church. Um, and that's what we're being a, gl a glimpse of here. But let me finish by moving on to the beloved disciple. Um, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined. There's the second reference to bosom next to Jesus. Again, you see it's all airbrushed out in that rather polite translation. Um, someone who was deeply intimate to Jesus and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? Um, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? There's a moment of kind of naked envy there, isn't there? Which is very kind of human and maybe reassuring to all of us if we've ever felt like that. Look at that smooth git. He's a... No, no, but not. <laughs> um, I can't think of an example without upsetting somebody. But you see what I'm saying. It's very easy to think, why have I got to cope with that? And that person doesn't. It's a very human feel. Um, and there's a bit of that here in Peter. But what Peter said, what, what Jesus says back is, um, uh, is extraordinarily important. Um, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Just as the church of office in John 21 is given two vocations, pastoral care, feed my sheep, and going into places you do not always wish to go, exile. So the church of love is given two vocations with which the gospel ends. One is abiding and the second is bearing witness. First, abiding. 
The word, the Greek word there translated rather boringly, translated remain, is menine, which means to make your home with or to abide. And it comes again and again in the uh, Gospel of John. In fact, it comes over 40 times. The only way to see it, if you don't read Greek, is to use the King James Version, which is as often very close to the original. And it is there, very close. Um, And it nearly always translates menine with the word abide make your home with and then you see how frequently it comes why is it important well in in the middle of the farewell discourse do you remember the apostle jude who only gets one line says to jesus lord how is it or why is it that you show yourself to us manifest yourself to us and not to the world it's a good question jude is asking jesus what's the point of the church Why did you reveal yourself to us? And Jesus says something about uh, those who love me. uh, I can't remember the words exactly, but the Father Father and I will come to them and make our home with them. Do you remember that? Which is the same Greek word, menine, abide with them. What does abide mean? It means living at depth with other people. Uh, It means uh, making your home with other people and making home for other people in you. It means a willingness to be silent as much as to talk. It's very striking that the beloved disciple says hardly anything. The one who Jesus loves says only two things in the whole gospel. One is, Lord, who is it at the supper? The second is, it is the Lord. Most of the time he's silent. But then some of the most important people in scripture most important witnesses in scripture are silent saint joseph the husband of the virgin mary who's beautifully represented in some carvings in this cathedral um, never says a word in scripture in matthew's gospel particularly where he appears and yet his role is crucial he because he's silent he's able to listen to the dreams do you remember the christmas story that tell him to take the mother and so on And it's not about him, it's about them. But he wouldn't have been able to do that if he hadn't been silent. I just remember, Bishop Pete will remember, the late David Jenkins, who memorably once said, generally speaking, bishops are generally speaking. (laughs) Which is another reason for coming to an end quickly. But um, uh, silence can bear witness as effectively as talking can. Um, But in this case, abiding is a little bit more than that. When Jesus says, uh, the Father and I will come to them and make our home with them, he's talking about the life-changing potential of a community of indwelling, a community of abiding. And the, the clearest way to see how important it is, is to remember near the end of John chapter 1 John the Baptist as it were releases two of his own disciples who go and follow Jesus do you remember and they say to Jesus and here you need the KJV uh, or the Greek Lord where are you abiding and Jesus says come and see they came and saw where he abode and they abode with him the word comes three times in about half a verse why is that important well if you look at that passage carefully you'll see they begin as outsiders um, who see Jesus as teacher rabbi they say brackets which translated means teacher where are you abiding then they go and abide with Jesus then they emerge and say to someone else they become a disciples evangelists we have found the messiah which is translated anointed so they've moved from being outsiders to being disciples from being spectators to being participants from being observers to being witnesses and what's made the difference abiding being close to jesus making space for jesus is absolutely fundamental to the life of the church dorothy lee a wonderful um modern methodist um modern i mean contemporary methodist australian theologian who's written a lovely thing about abiding and uh, got the notes here talks about how abiding is not grounded in external achievement or action but derives energy from an inner source an indwelling that is intimate and personal so an abiding community will always be rooted in a making space for the other and that's costly Simone Weil a French writer not an orthodox Christian but a profound thinker talks about how the very act of creating the the cosmos on the part of God requires a willingness to make space for the other for something that is not God do you see what she means that you're you're having God is as it were relinquishing 
absolute uh, control over being and making room for a universe in order that there can be something that is not God. And all um, creative Christian ministry involves a making space for the other. And it's hard work, tiring, because it involves putting self on one side. And that's why we need constantly to be assured that we ourselves are made space for I was saying last night how uh, Jerry Hughes, the Jesuit who wrote some lovely books like um, oh, God of Surprises and others, he's dead now, but um, came from the same place in Scotland as my wife. Um, what did I say that? Oh, and Jerry Hughes, I remember hearing him talk once about how you might react if um, Jesus were to come and knock on your door one day and ask to come in and you knew without any doubt that it really was Jesus and not your best friend taking the mickey out of you. How would you respond? Well, Jerry says, well, probably as a Christian, one hopes you would invite Jesus in. Probably also you'd then quietly leave him for a moment and go and ring your diocesan bishop or Justin Welby or uh, Pope Francis and say, oh, by the way, Pope, Jesus has just come to my house. Pity he didn't pick you. Funny that. <laughs> He's picked me. Sorry, but you could come round if you want on our book. You, you know, you sort of luxuriate in it a bit. Jesus has chosen you. But after that, says Jerry Hughes, it'll get more and more difficult. Why? Because you'll have to make space for Jesus in more ways than simply inviting him in. Difficult ethical issues will arise. Should you give him a drink before dinner? Would he be a gin and tonic man or not approve of someone having that and want a glass of water? Or where you can't put Jesus in the box room, spare room, you'd have to put him in your room and you'd have to move into the... Do you see what I mean? You're having to make space. And the next day when you go to work, if you've got work to go to, would you take him with you or leave him? Him back in your house. And in the end, Jerry Hughes suggests probably what you do, you couldn't bear to let Jesus go, you'd feel a failure. So what you do is you'd lock him in the broom cupboard and you'd put a, you put a sanctuary light upstairs and you'd genuflect to it every time you went past. <laughs> but you'd leave him in there. And that, says Jerry Hughes, who was a Jesuit, is what the institutional church can so easily do to Jesus Christ if it forgets the presence of the church of love, forgets the witness of the church of love. Um, it's about making space. I haven't got time to go into it now, but let me just mention as another example of this making space, wonderful book um, by a non-Christian, um, Richard Rogers, the architect, called Cities for a New Planet and he talks in there about cities I was thinking, it came into my mind this morning coming in here about the difference between two different sorts of geographical space you find in a city or a village for that matter. Um, one is what he calls single minded spaces like a home which is for one single purpose to live in or a shop um, and what he calls open minded spaces, spaces that are there for any number of different purposes and he suggests that the, the spiritual and moral health of a community depends on the value and reverence it gives, the priority it gives to its open-minded spaces. Churches are open-minded spaces, cathedrals supremely. It doesn't mean they're value-free, doesn't mean anything goes. Uh, it means they're hopefully safe places where we welcome all kinds of people, uh, but that can introduce its own challenges. What about people who have coronavirus? What about people who have personality disorders? It isn't an easy inclusivism to talk about abiding. Rather, it's to say all are welcome, but all will be invited to change and become the new person God in Christ asks us to be. And yet, for all the challenges, Christian abiding is the essence of what the church's witness is to be. Uh, Life-changing communities where we make space for the other because God in Christ has first made space for us. So to the conclusion, and the other, um, uh, I'm going to move, skip past that. Um, the, other, the other thing about the disciple whom Jesus loved, about the church of love, one is uh, abiding uh, of his twofold vocation or her, the other is bearing witness. This is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things or testifying uh, and has written them. And we know, there's the we again, that his testimony is true. The word witness, as you'll surely know in, in Greek, martyrine, is the same as the word for martyr. So witnessing will always involve a dying, whether it's a physical martyr as Peter, by tradition, uh, was being, uh, well, well, we're told there was going to be, uh, or um, uh, 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 the martyrdom of giving up of self. 
um, in, in a, I think, a profound article, again by a non-Christian, um, that was introduced to me by my, my wife's a consultant psychiatrist, which is a full-time job. Uh, sorry, no, it's a great privilege. But she, um, age, no, no, it wasn't her. Sorry, anyway, no, it doesn't matter. It was a friend of hers as a psychotherapist um, who, who gave me an article which I found profoundly moving. I want to finish just by referring to it. It's by somebody called Dick Blackwell who spent his life working for uh, a thing called the Medical Foundation for Victims of Torture. So he'd been dealing with deeply traumatized people. And in this article, and the references to all this I can give you if you're interested, Blackwell talks about his experience as a therapist. And I suggest in conclusion that this is relevant to uh, all of our call to bear witness. He says that your instinct as a therapist dealing with someone who's been damaged in some terrible way is to help them. But helping people can all too easily say more about your need to be needed than it can about where they're at. Do you know what I mean? It can mean, obviously it's better than not helping people, uh, but it isn't always what's the appropriate thing. Instead, says Blackwell, over years of therapy, I learned that my role was different from that. It was to hold and contain and bear witness. Holding meaning to, as the mother holds her child, creating a safe place, which is why clerical abuse is such a horrifying sin, because it destroys that sense of trust essential to holding. A holding community where people feel held and feel safe. A containing community. To contain somebody means to absorb all that they bring with them, including their rage and puzzlement, in Peter's case, his grief and hurt, at Jesus constantly interrogating him. Jesus contains all that. The word containing now carries a terrifying new resonance because we talk about containing the coronavirus and that's a challenge for all of us. But at the heart of Christian life is the conviction that creating abiding communities where people feel held and contained, where they can bring all of themselves and allow all of that to be healed and redeemed and transfused into, some, into a new future uh, is, is maybe the best way we can bear witness to a different kind of future. And finally, uh, as I've already said, bearing witness itself. Bearing witness, says um, Blackwell, is to give a voice to people who may well have felt, especially victims of torture, that they have no voice giving a place to people who felt they've had no place. A great deal of bearing witness will happen not just by going out into the streets, but by getting down on our knees, by giving a voice to people who feel they have no voice. We bear witness to them in the hope and prayer that there will be others out there when we have no voice who will bear witness to us. And that the, so essentially bearing witness is not just a, a vocalizing thing, it's about a way of being there, a manner of presence, of being among people, of being there for people. And in the end, that's what will transform the world. The Gospel of John ends uh, with that last verse, and I must finish just by mentioning that, although I'm sorry, as always, I've gone on much too long. There are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. There are two final things to be said, both referring to that extraordinary conclusion. One is the word world, the other is the word I. The world comes constantly in John's Gospel, and usually it has a negative connotation. The Greek word cosmos just means created order, the whole creation, not just planet Earth. But in John, it's usually, not always, but usually hostile. He came into the world, and the world did not receive him. Remember in the prologue, picked up here again at the very end, or if the world hates you, remember that it hated me before you. The world is central to the gospel, and yet it's normally hostile, which makes all the more amazing that astonishing and incredibly famous text when Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that Jesus came into the world not in order to condemn the world, but, that, but to save the world. God, Jesus does not say God so loved the church, 
He doesn't even say God so loved human beings. He says God so loved the whole creation, the whole world, the animals that died in that, those awful Australian bushfire. They are all part of God's creation as much as we are and the damage to the climate and so on. That is all part of what John means by the world. And what he's saying in this last verse as he finishes is that one day how through changed lives the whole world in all its damagedness, will be transfigured by the love of Christ. The whole creation will be healed. And that's the future we look forward to. And as we look forward to it, the other key word in chapter, verse 25 is the single letter I. I said at the beginning that the word we appears in chapter 1 and in chapter 21. The word I appears uniquely in the gospel right at the very end. It's as though the storyteller, the beloved disciple, the person, man or woman whom Jesus loved, suddenly appears on stage just as the curtain is ringing down like a, a theatre production and suddenly says, well that's about it guys, there's so much more I could have said, so much more I could have told you, but I haven't got time and anyway it's not about me, it's about him, so I'll get out of the way. Bye and he pops off stage again. Don't you think that's lovely? Just a tiny reminder that in the end, we're all actors, however short our part, uh, and we have a part to play in it too. Thank you. I'm so sorry to have gone on so long. Um, um, oh, and I forgot to mention John 17. Let me just say this as I finish. Um, where Jesus praying for his disciples sums up the whole message of this um, talk about being loved and bearing witness as you father are in me and I in you may they also be in us so that the world may believe that sums up the whole gospel of John that the indwelling abiding intimate love that we're called to reproduce in our own Christian churches and in our own lives that will one day change the entire cosmos I'm so sorry to have gone on so long um I think perhaps if we just take a couple of minutes just to kind of yawn or <laughs> stand up or, or be relieved that you're not having to listen to any more talking. And then we'll have a few minutes just to, have we got the time still for questions? So if we just take two minutes of silence, or, or I mean, don't mean silent, I mean, you know, manoeuvring about. And then if you want to ask some questions, we'll have a few minutes for that too. Oh, no, no, you don't have to. <laughs> don't need to do that. Um, no, 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 really. <laughs> Thank you.